All right, we're still in chapter 10 dealing with cultural diversity, and we have been talking about the Fair Housing Act and the people that are protected and the seven classes uh, that are federally protected, which is the same seven that Indiana uses. Uh, we talked about who can file, and virtually I gave a whole list. Um, it really can be summed up about virtually about anybody can file a fair housing claim, all right? So keep that in mind. Now, what are some of the prohibited practices by the, as defined by the fair housing? The first one I want to talk about is this thing called blo block busting. Block busting was also, there was another term for it, that they called it panic selling, all right? My screen's not acting the way it should. Panic selling. And they actually dubbed this a nickname. Called the white flight. And basically blockbusting is a method of manipulating the homeowners to sell or rent their homes at a discount price by falsely convincing them that there is some minority that's going to be moving into their white neighborhood and will lower the property values just by virtue of being involved in that neighborhood. This is a legal activity called blockbusting. And like I said, they used to cause panic selling. Um, there was examples I went out and read uh, of a group in the 50s that were hiring black females to walk dogs in predominantly white neighborhood so that they were very visual. And then this investment group would send a letter to the people talking about, hey, you know, your property values are going to go down. Once it becomes segregated, you should sell your property now and move to the next white neighborhood. It was horrific to read and unbearable to understand, but it actually happened. So it's called blockbusting or the white flight, and it was intended to induce any kind of panic selling. Now, panic selling has been around, and they use it a lot of other times in to do with things like, hey, the toxic waste dump may be moving in here, you better sell your property. So that term panic selling has been used in other situations, not just fair housing violations, but it most certainly can be used in this area as well. There was a term called redlining and redlining literally involved people drawing a red line around an area of a map and then would refuse to give services to people inside of that red line because of the neighborhoods that they were in and the quote unquote people that were there, all right? And it was actually coined by a term there, you can see a sociologist named James McKnight, uh, that how lenders and insurance companies would literally draw a red line on a map and say, hey, don't invest in this neighborhood because of the demographics. So that was called redlining. Now, to go along with that, there's actually a second term that was the mortgage industry had this thing called reverse redlining. Reverse redlining virtually is just the opposite of that. They would take a map, draw a circle around it, and then they would intentionally go after the people inside of that circle by offering them higher interest rate loans, higher uh, premiums on insurance policies, because of the fact that they were a minority. Now, one of the things that you might think about is, does this stuff really happen? Well, here's a quote that you can find that's actually true, and this is in 2012, just eight years ago. Wells Fargo was accused and eventually settled out a suit, or settled out of court, uh, claiming that they were actually charging African Americans and Latinos higher rate on fees on mortgages than white counterparts. That would be a construed as a reverse redlining, where they were actually going after a specific target and giving them uh, higher rate mortgages and things of that nature. So this still does exist as early as 2012. I mean, that wasn't that long ago. Now, 
inside of the fair housing, let's talk a little bit about the advertising and the marketing. Now, I will tell you that this is probably one of my issues I have a hard time dealing with. And as you can see, you'll see why here in a minute. Advertising violations, showing only people in ethnic dress or people of one gender, especially the male, advertising written in a language. I guess all advertising is, is written in a language, isn't it? In, I don't even know how to say that. Um, I'll give you some example of what I mean here. Here's the other thing that's important about fair housing advertising. Spoken word count. So this just doesn't mean print or advertisement. This also means if you say something, if your maintenance man may be saying, well, only real Americans live here, you know, that could be construed as a violation. So here's some examples of violations of the fair housing. And this is where I kind of have a slight issue with this. And I get that we should all be nice to each other and you should only discriminate against the color green. If a person has green, you're my client. If you don't, then you're not my client. But here are some things straight out of HUD's guidelines. And I'll tell you that I stopped reading stuff after about three or four hours just for this page alone because there is so much out there. For instance, here's one. Advertising only in English media, whether there's, if there's other language media based available. So what I'm telling you is this, what is the official language of the United States? Why don't you go ahead and hit pause for a minute and think about it and hit play when you're ready to go again? Because I will tell you there is no official language. That's right. English is not the official language of the United States. It is just so happened that the predominant number of people that landed here and established a colony and a legal system and a constitutional system all spoke English. There was never an intent to have an official language. So what I'm telling you is if you advertise only in the English language, you could in potential be in violation of the fair housing law because that English would discriminate against people such as the Burmese that maybe don't speak English or um, who's the other uh, Japanese or any of the Asian cultures that come over here that don't speak English. So as you can see, this now puts a burden on you to go, oh, how do I advertise a property if it's not in every language? We've got La Ola magazine in Indianapolis, which is geared toward the Hispanic. There's the German Park uh, newspaper. There is one that comes out of Chicago that's in uh, Japanese. So there are other language newspapers and based upon the way this is written, you could actually be in violation if you are not advertising in all of the newspapers. Now I know that HUD considers us to not be a limitless pit of money so I don't think they would ever find us in violation if this was the true and only violation that you would create. Lord, I hope not because as I can tell you now in 20 years, I have maybe less than 10 times put an advertisement in another language other than English, uh, put all the open houses and all that stuff in our MLS system. Our MLS system in Indianapolis doesn't even account for other languages. So, you know, you've got issues there. Um, newspapers that only select a geographic area could also be construed as uh, discriminatory. So if you're only printing in the um, Meridian Kessler newspaper, as opposed to the Indianapolis newspaper, um, Any time that you use human models that might indicate a preference. There was a gentleman uh, builder in the East Coast who built properties and he built downtown um, properties. 
in his advertisement, he used a family that was black, who mother, father, husband, wife, and children, and had, was actually sued by the ACLU uh, because they their claim was that he was referencing that only black people lived downtown, and therefore actually was to the tune of like a $2 million fine for him and literally put him out of business. There are lists of words. You can actually go and Google lists of words that you can't use. And to me, they're all over the board as to what seems to be discriminatory. Let me give you an example. Here's a word that, that HUD said is allowed. Master bedroom. All right, but this word is not. To me, this word actually does come from a term and a time in our society when we had masters and slaves and the master bedroom is where the master slept in. To me, that has more of a racial preference than this, which actually can be construed as a violation against somebody with a handicap, and you are supposed to put within proximity of the park, not walking distance to the park. So you, we could go for hours about what you can and can't say, and you can look over at Google once again. I am not trying to shirk my duty as an educator, but I'm trying to tell you that we have limited time and every topic, specifically in the fair housing topic, can be a rabbit hole in and of itself. And I have fallen into that rabbit hole several different times just in this topic. The uh, fact that uh, the advertising alone, one subtopic of a topic, um, they talked about that they actually gave you, in one of the web pages I looked at, they gave you advice on how to advertise. And the, the advice seemed discriminatory in nature. I mean, it literally said, in order to not seem discriminatory, you should select people that are in wheelchairs or multiple ethnic people or different races. So in essence, they were actually forcing us to segregate people out to make sure that we weren't segregating people out. Um, and I don't know if I can, if I come across explaining what I was trying to explain. Let me give you another example. In the mortgage industry, which I am a licensed mortgage loan originator, you can, for purposes of government statistics, you record certain things. Race is one of them. If the person declines to answer the question, Guess what the mortgage loan originator is supposed to do? They are supposed to make a judgment based on physical features and declare a race anyway. And that whole purpose is to determine that they weren't being racial or segregatory or discriminatory in nature. So you actually have to make a discriminatory comment or a racially, um, what's the word, inspired declaration to prove that you aren't racist. Seems kind of strange to me, all right? So this is a very harsh topic that they need to make sure that you understand. Now there's some other issues. Obviously we talked about the advertising issue. Uh, we've talked about as an agent, you could be liable for making a fair housing claim. Well, it actually goes the other way too, and I wanna make sure we back up and talk about that. If your client wants to make a claim of fair housing, maybe your client has been discriminated against. You therefore, in fact, can adjoin that lawsuit because in essence, you have been harmed as well in the form of not gaining a commission because your client wasn't allowed to buy the property based on some uh, violation of the fair housing on the seller's side. Not only could he file a claim, you could file a claim against them as well. So if you were the listing agent, it could be filed against you 
if you were the selling agent, you could potentially be involved in a racial discrimination suit because your client was, and you are de facto one of your clients, um, an extension of your client, all right? So that's the pretty cool thing about that from that standpoint. Now, we're gonna talk about the enforcement and we kind of touched on this already in a previous slide, so let's just fill it in. Remember, you have 365 days from the day that they, of, of the alleged act, to file that complaint. And when you file the complaint, it's probably going to get kicked down to the state, and then the first thing they're gonna look at is this conciliation. Now, conciliation is the mediation. This is where you guys hug and make up and everything's okay, and there is a true belief that it was maybe it was an accident and the other person now is not aggrieved. But remember, here's the biggest thing to remember about the Fair Housing Act. It is a result law or an effects law. That's another way to look at it. It's an effects law. It's not an intent law. What that means is you do not have to have an intention of violating the Fair Housing Act, but if the result or the effect was someone that was that felt offended, that could be a violation. There does not have to be an, any intent to be present. You cannot stand in front of a judge and say, I'm sorry, I did not mean, and then from there on it doesn't matter. The judge is going to say that it doesn't matter. It's a results law. So if you said something and maybe you had no intent, the person felt offended, they filed a claim, HUD tries a conciliation, and that person then honestly believes that maybe you weren't, they could agree that conciliation is the answer. You could ultimately get pushed a little further and go into similar some civil or criminal act convictions, all right? If it is a violation of the race, which is the Civil Rights Act of 1866, which had race as the only protected class, dude, that's a federal lawsuit out of the gate. So that's a federal lawsuit because it was the first and big mamaluka that came about. So if there is a race card played and the violation is claimed upon race, it could go to federal court. Now here's the big pain or the big kicker. Federal court can be unlimited punitive damages. Punitive, you guys know what punitive means? Punitive means punishment. So in other words, the court could punish you up to 20, 50, 100 million dollars. Seems extreme and I'm not trying to use the scare tactic, but I'm just saying it's an unlimited, there is no cap listed in the uh, fair housing claim. So it could be a $2 million punitive damage. How are you going to pay that? Plus you could also, like I said before, have a loss of your license, which could further detriment your professional uh, career from here on out. So. This is a very, very serious rule. It is one that you need to be cognizant of so that you do not make a mistake. Uh, it's a serious issue and it maintains serious equal treatment with all the violators. You must treat everybody of equal stature. There should be no discrimination across the board. And like I said, let's go back to my one joke, which wasn't really a joke, is this is where you have the issue. Green, you've got it in your mind. If you're in a wheelchair, that doesn't bother me. If you are of a, a emerging market, doesn't bother me. If you don't have money or credit, then yes, you are not my client, all right? Once again, violations are not based upon the intent, but rather the effect of the action and it is hard to prove that someone didn't feel discriminated against. How do you disprove a person's feelings? Violations of the race clause go straight to federal court. 
There is no passing go and collecting $200. You go straight to the federal court and unlimited damages. Remember, all states can be more restrictive, not less. Indiana is a cut and paste, so we deal with the seven protected classes. Washington State does protect sexual orientation. They protect military status. They do protect age. So there are other states that have more than seven classes because you can, they can be more prote protective and not less. All right. So what I want you to do is go out and spend some time and study the fair housing law. Literally, I want you to dedicate three to four hours to reading this on Google. It will do nothing but enhance your professionalism and potentially reduce any liability that you may, that you think, oh, I've been doing this fine and then find out you're not. Okay, that's lesson number 10. I think we've got one more in this course and we're gonna be calling it quits. Once again, I'm Raymond Modulin. I'm the director of Real University. I'd like for you to go out and like us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Go to Google and write us a review. Unless you don't like us, then don't say anything. <laughs> All right? If you have any questions, feel free to email me. I'm at Raymond at realuniversity.com.